Hey guys, my name is Dan Kirby. I'm a drummer from Melbourne, Australia. Today I'm here at my drum school, DK Drums Academy, and I have the absolute honor of hosting an episode of Sound is the New 4K by Zoom. I was previously a guest on this podcast, and today I am interviewing none other than the host of the show himself, Mr. Anthony Gordon. How are you doing there, my man? <laughs> hey mate, yeah, it's uh, it's certainly a bit different, isn't it? It's it's nice that the pressure's not on me for a change, so I'm going to make it as difficult as possible for you. you know? Fantastic. <laughs> so, so obviously, um, for for the listeners who are just jumping in right now, um, you are uh, one of Australia's premium filmmakers like i jumped on your website earlier obviously i follow you on instagram we have since since our chat on this episode we've become mates and we're, we're chatting and whatnot and i see everything that you do and mate i i jumped on your website and clicked on your promo video um which kind of had ugh, so many of your highlight uh you know parts of your highlight reel on that and mate you are a guy who has done everything in the world of film by the looks of it. Like you have covered all action sports, you've covered all adventure, you've covered uh, projects where you're giving back to the community. You've, you've done everything. So for me, uh, and I think for, for our listeners, what I would like to, to get out of today's interview is to kind of understand a little bit more about what you've done, where you've come from, how you've kind of gotten to where you're at, I really want to zone in on some of um, the more important pieces you have done um, as well. Um, so for a start, I mean, when did this start for you? Uh, like, How long have you been doing this for? Because judging by your reel, you've been doing this forever. Yeah, it, it seems like I should be 142 years old. Um, and occasionally I do look back through, I guess, the last 25 years and just think, Heck, like it doesn't seem like it's all been real. I mean, when I when I was when I was a young kid, sort of growing up, I grew up in Bondi in in, in Sydney, and uh, I think from a very early age, I used to, for some reason, I think my dad had a mate that had a whole lot of National Geographic magazines. He was a truck driver, a guy called Peter, and I remember he used to come past their house, and I'd jump in the back of his truck, and I'd start reading these Nat Geo magazines. And on the back, there was always these these camera pictures of amazing, like a camera and a, and a place, and I. I was fascinated by, I guess, the world. And when you're growing up in a, you know, sort of very back in those days, it was kind of a small town. It wasn't the Bondi that it is today. And you sort of think, how am I ever going to be a storyteller? And I guess over the years, it's always just been in my blood telling stories. And all I've done, I mean, even when I go back to some of my old primary school and high school reports, it says Anthony just doesn't shut up he just sits there telling stories all the time so for me it was just a matter of putting a camera in between my brain and what was happening and I never really had a plan and to tell you the truth I still don't have a plan it it, it I don't know how it happened I really don't um I look at I look at some of the early shots where I where I was um you know, carrying little still cameras around when I was 12 or 13 years old and I mean mate I as with your career behind the drums when you look at what you've done and what I did research before I chatted with you it must seem surreal because you're still the guy that that grew up in in Melbourne and and now you're doing these things so for a lot of people that look at what I've done it's you know you're still the same person as you were when you were 14 years old mm -hmm. you just have greater means to do it so it started it started when I was when I was young, and I just had this passion for storing, the telling telling stories. You know, there's no, and you know, there was no courses. There was no way to learn how to do this stuff. Yeah, you just had to figure it out, navigate your own way through it. And and I relate to that. I mean, I started playing drums purely because I love drums. I, I didn't know I didn't even know I wanted to be in a band, or, or or really I didn't even know how drums really worked within a band. I just liked drums. So much much the same as you. Um, I th I feel like we're just gonna have a match. We'll just gravitated towards our craft naturally um you have to have a passion you have to if, if you're if you start out in any career saying i want to make money because i want to buy a house or i want to make money because i've seen you've got to go into finance i've covered so many people in my career behind the camera and none of them not one successful person has become successful because they want to be successful not one yeah. Not one single person. And, and I remember um, I did a story for um, 
for a business series I made on Channel 9 and I had the, I guess, the privilege of spending a day with Lindsay Fox. Hmm. So uh, a, a massive, massive presence of a man. And, and I went to his offices in Melbourne and I said to Lindsay, how did this all happen? Same sort of question you asked me. And Lindsay right. said, he said, uh, he sat back. It was his 72nd birthday and he sat back and goes, mate, it's a friggin' miracle. And I said, well, why is that? He said, I, was, I grew up in country New South Wales and I used to sit on my front fence and all I saw was trucks go past. And he said, I fell in love with trucks and I figured, geez, if there's so many trucks. If you've got a lot of trucks, you might do okay. And that's how his transport world started because he had a passion for something. It just happened to be trucks. Yours was drums. Yep. Mine happened to be storytelling. And I think anyone that watches this, if you've got a passion for something, just stick with it. It'll get horrible at times, but stick with it. And you, you know what? There's a better chance you'll end up where you want to be than if you just want to be rich. You know? Yeah, exactly. And, and I think that's a valuable lesson for, for the listeners to take on board. And it's something that I often hear in podcasts and whatnot as well. It's a reoccurring thing. You just do what you have a passion for and eventually it will work out. Yeah, It, might, it mightn't seem that it will. And, and mm. I mean, I'm sure you've had many, many more days thinking like this than not that she got to go and get a job. Mm. you know especially through the COVID times you think well, what's going to happen but when you've had this passion you've followed it you tend to adapt a lot better than if you have been working for someone else mm -hmm. and so I think um, it's it's the good times are small but they're well worth it you know yep I 100% I agree now now moving on from that um, you asked me a question in our interview and and I, I really liked it and it was what is sound to you so in terms of what you do, you, you create epic content, video mixed with audio. Obviously, audio is a massive component to, to what you do. So I gave an answer as to what audio is to me and what sound is to me. What is audio and sound to you in your profession? You know, I, I, had, I used to have a different answer before I started this podcast. Mm -hmm. And speaking to, to just miracle creators, I call them like yourself, um, Nigel Christensen really impacted me a lot in terms of how he spoke about sound. And I actually started to think about the question myself. And, and realistically, it's a very simple answer. Sound for me is vision, okay? Mm -hmm. Because without sound, you don't have a vision. Now, people say, well, what's vision? I could put a picture in a, in a doco of someone smiling and put sounds that are related to misery and war and horrible stuff and I could ask a room of 50 people, how did they feel? No one will feel like they were smiling. They'll all feel like they were sad, but they were looking at someone smiling. So sound in the context of everything is is quite uh, an image. Uh, what it does is, I, I believe now, after, especially after the podcast, that when you put the right sound with your edits, you'll create what you want people to see. If, if you know what I mean. So all that the vision does is reinforce that. So you, you put, um, and since I interviewed you, I've been putting a lot more beats in my edits, a lot oh. more beats, but it's been flowing quicker and I've used, I've used shorter clips and mm -hmm. it creates the same emotion. So I think for me, yeah, sound actually does create the vision and, and the whole purpose of the, the podcast was you can't fix bad sound. So get the sound right, put the sound there, and it will make the vision look even better. And all this, all this has done is reinforced the idea I had by speaking to amazing sound creators. And it's actually changed my path of editing after 25 years. So, that, that's, awesome. so that, 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 that's what sound is. It's so important. It's the only thing, really. It, it is. I, um, I recently did a shoot with Bliss and Esso. Um, and, and leading into the performance part of the shoot, Myself and Bliss drove into the warehouse in an old Cadillac, which I, you, you saw, you commented on it. I, I did all the sound for that whole minute skit. And I was thinking of you when I was doing it, because when I, I we, the director kind of cut the footage together first, sent that through and he was like, put some sound to this. And man, it made such a difference. Like when I first saw it, it was kind of a little bit underwhelming to be honest. And then once all of the sound was put in and, and there was some low end frequencies to kind of build it, it up. Let like, it, it let it in. It, it let everything in. Because everyone yeah. that, that follows Blues knew what was coming, right? Yeah. But it, it was it was like the band walking on stage. And that yeah. and, 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 and and when you did your post specifically, you had to like turn the sound up because you can listen to what's going in. 
and and that that it, it it set the stage. And even if the first three or four verses weren't great, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter because you've already set that stage. You know what I mean? So. It's, uh, it, it made it work. And also considering what you had to work with at the time was yeah. quite limited. Yeah. And, and, and I agree. And that's a cool way to compare it to like a live show. Like when you go to see a band, the lights go down and there's generally some kind of epic music coming out, um, you know, and you want to feel that bottom end bass coming out of the subs, which kind of rattles your body and kind of gives you an excited feeling. Just the sound creates more of an atmosphere, 100%, both audibly and physically because you can f- – feel the floor shaking oh look i mean when you when you look at um the whole sport of boxing mm. pe- people if you ask everyone around the world about rocky and creed they'll all remember them walking in more than they will the fight yeah and that and, that, and that's what's established and 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 even some of the the clips you've sent me that you've made with bliss and and and, and some of the other the other gigs it's all established at the start yeah and then, and then you just carry and all you got to do then is carry the vibe through the end yeah, that, that's that's a really cool perspective. I, I mean, that's something that I, I kind of, I guess, subconsciously knew, but I never really thought about with, with those clips. Like, he's setting the tone from the, from the get-go. Yeah, and also with social media these days, uh, I mean, all of our worlds have changed. You've got to get people straight away. If you go back 10 years, uh, you, you, you've got a, a bit of a fuck-around factor. You know, you can lead in a bit. You can maybe do some graphics. You can, you can spice it up that way. Now, you're into it straight away. The first sound bite, if it doesn't come in the first second and grab someone, mm. you know, statistics show they're gone. So um, our world's become more complex, but also more crucial. Absolutely. No, I, I 100% agree with that. Some, some good insight there. Now, um, I wanted to uh, move on and speak more uh, about you and, and everything you have done. Um, on the way here this morning, I, was, wasn't, I wasn't necessarily thinking about this interview, but I was specifically thinking about a few moments that I've had on stage, which I remembered very clearly and, and the moments that i remember very clearly are the moments where i felt emotional for whatever reason and i've probably got four or five out of my whole playing career of however many gigs i've done i've got about four or five moments that i could pinpoint exactly where i was what song i was playing who i was playing with uh who was around you know i can picture it very clearly now, given what you do, you've, you've worked on thousands of in- incredible projects. Do you have, uh, and have a think about if you could share some of these with me, do you have potentially two or three moments um, that you specifically remember as being extremely special to you, perhaps because they gave you a feeling more so than the actual what you were actually doing? They provided you with a feeling whilst you were doing what you do. Man, you just cleaned the floor with me on that one. <laughs> when, you, when you said you were going to do your research, um, that's crazy, isn't it? Uh, yeah, there are. There's probably two or three that, that really stand out. Um, the, the first one, uh, I used to do some work with the, with the Subaru World Rally team. And, uh, and we were in, in uh, doing Rally New Zealand and Peter Solberg, who was the then world champion, I was, I was filming as part of his team. And Valentino Rossi had just started to to drive. Um, he came from MotoGP to do a, a, a you know a stint with the team, and uh, and he'd arrived. And you can imagine there was just a massive, massive media following from this. And we were going into the last stages, and Peter was was just behind, and he le- he needed to perform. There was a lot of money involved, and I remember looking behind the the booth where he normally sits. And he was sitting there crying. And, and, and I remember just looking at him going, this is Peter Solberg. Like just, and I, and I had my camera. I didn't, I didn't put the camera on him. It's, it's like, this is his moment, but this is a world champion and he's a human. And he wow. was literally shitting himself with what was going to happen. He went out there, won the rally, took home the prize. But at that moment, people don't get to see that. And, and, I remember going outside and just sort of sitting in the in 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 the car park there, thinking, okay, they, these guys are at the top of their game, but, but they're human. Um, and the, the second one also happened in sport. I made Leighton Hewitt's, uh, I guess, life story, um, which was a, a whirlwind as it was, and and I was lucky enough to be with him when he lost to Marit Safin in the final of the Australian Open. So it was the closest that that an Aussie had got. And, uh, and I remember that was also the night that he, 
he got engaged to Beck and we were at this after party that was that was pretty loose. Um, Johnny Farnham just turned up to play for him in the basement of the hotel, as he does, right? And uh, and I remember the next morning walking into his room and he had you know a big room with the grand piano at the, at the Grand Height there in Melbourne. And I remember standing there and again, it was a moment where I just put the camera down. Um, he was leaning over over the uh, the headline of the the age, and it said Leighton loses. Oh. So he so he just got to the final of the of the Australian Open. He'd lost. He proposed to his now wife the same night. He got oh. totally loose with John Farnham at an after party. Yet it meant nothing because he was looking over this newspaper that said Leighton loses. And then I looked in the corner. And the plate that he got given for coming second was in the garbage bin. What? And 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 I, I, I sat there. I literally stood at the door, and I said, "Rusty, mate, like, what's with that?" And he said, "Mate, those plates are used for barbecues, and I've got plenty of barbecue plates." And that's <laughs> and no word of a lie. And, and I remember thinking again, he is, he's a human being. And he, he didn't care. He didn't, and no one saw that side of him. And I think, uh, and, and again, I just closed the door and, and walked down, um, walked down the hallway. And, and you sort of think, um, okay, there, there's a there's some real stories there that the people never get to see, and you're privileged to be in that position to see that. Um, and I guess the third one, which 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 definitely stands out, is when we put together the the world's first Sherpa rescue team that we ended up turning into a series on Everest back in 2016. And again, you, 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 it all comes together. You get a series up, you raise the money, you put it there. And then at the end of the season, you're sitting there, we'd say 52 lives. We'd filmed it. I was, I guess, fortuitously in the show rather than making it. And I'm just sitting at base camp, totally shagged. I mean, we'd spent three months living at 5,600 meters, the emotional ups and downs of not just, what we were doing, but also making a TV show. And uh, a helicopter flew in um, and his dude got out with a suit and his shoes and he was, um, Ming the Sherpa, who was probably one of the most famous Sherpas in Nepal, literally walked up to me, gave me a hug and said, thank you for doing what you did for the people in Nepal. Got back on his helicopter and flew off. And I, I just sat there and I was just crying. It was like, what the fuck's going on? It, it was just this crazy epoch of, of emotions that, that happened. And I guess when you think of those three things that stand out over a career, mm. it doesn't seem real. It's like, how did you get here? Like, I'm sure you'd sat at a drum kit mm. and you've had that. It probably seems like an hour, but it's, yeah. it's a millisecond. And you look around and you, and you get in that vibe and you're getting yourself into that position. Mm -hmm. And then you think, how the fuck did I get here? <laughs> how, how, how am I sitting here right now? Because it yeah. doesn't make sense. And yeah. those three moments... I guess uh, have been um, a standout. There, there, I mean, there's, there's lots of others, but those ones will always be embellished that all famous people are human. Yep. And all humans can be famous. And th yep. that, that's really the, the, the bottom line. Um, yep. And uh, yeah, so that's Mate, they're, 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 they're some standouts. They're, they are epic answers. And um, yeah, and, uh, and they are, you answered the question very well there. They're, they're, they're all um, big moments. And I, and I guess what I was thinking when you were telling me the first two stories, I guess those athletes, um, you know, hugely world famous um, and the majority of people only see them on uh, TV or in, on, on the internet or in newspapers. They see pictures, they see videos, which is kind of what you do in a sense. You're kind of in that media-ish world. Um, and that's kind of how they're presented to everybody. Everyone sees that. But as you just said, you're in that privileged kind of position where you can actually see what's going on. So, you know, the, the benefits from that are huge because from the outside, you might see someone like Leighton Hewitt or whatever, and, and you just think it's, it's, it's all awesome and it's fantastic. But really behind the scenes, although there's a lot of good things associated with that kind of lifestyle, they're just, as you said, they are just people. And, and what when I was watching, I was watching a, a podcast online. Um, with quite a famous um, gig photographer, so band photographer, he's been around since the since, since the Beatles, mm -hmm. and he said something quite pertinent, and that was his job is so fulfilling because people never see what actually goes on to make a gig happen, yeah. and it is insane. And he went through everything from from the ticket booth through through 
the guys that, that all the roadies that run the cables and all the basic stuff that you know you could have the biggest concert on earth and you have one cable that's not plugged in and the whole thing comes down and, and i think a lot of people you know sometimes you don't want to know all about that because you just want to have that experience yep. but there is a there is a lot that goes on and, and i guess we've both seen a lot of that stuff and, and it mm. formulates who you are and how you go on to your next project i guess a hundred percent now um Moving on from that, uh, I've seen that you've done a lot in the action world sports. Um, obviously, so I work for Monster, as, as you can tell here, I'm working today. I've just popped in here for a minute. I, I um, you know, I'm around action sports a lot. Um, I've seen kind of how a lot of it happens behind the scenes, you know what I mean? It's quite full on and intense. Um, have you worked quite a lot with the motocross industry yourself? Yeah, you know, I, I started years ago. Um, I don't know how I fell into it. I ended up um, covering and being the producer for the Krusty Demons World Tour, and wow. uh, and 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 working with the guys out of Australia, but also um, John Freeman, who 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 owned it, and and Dana um, out of uh, La Quinta in the US. So I, I spent a year or two on the road with Seth and Bubba and and and, and Brian Deegan and man, wow, that's an, ex- so, that, that's an experience, yeah. So with, I mean, because they were like the kings of freestyle, right? They basically started freestyle and they started like freestyle shows. Like Seth Enslow is a living legend. He's uh, actually good friends with Hep from Twenty Eight Days, my, my guitarist, because Twenty Eight Days played on a Krusty Demons show years and years and years ago. <laughs> um, questions around that with. I actually had never been to a crusty show. Were, were they on? Did they do anything on Harley's? You know how Seth Enslow was super famous for doing massive jumps on Harley's. Yeah. They, so yeah. Seth, um, they, they they didn't. There's a whole mix of stuff. The, the, the tour I did was all just on on freestyle bikes, and that's when Trigger Gum did the world record jump. But Seth had done it a few years before. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, Seth's just a he's a he is a larger than life character. I remember I remember sitting in his. Um, in his house in uh, in a, just outside of LA, and um, and there was a on his, on his dining room table it's a glass top and it's got Uzis and all these nunchuckers <laughs> and all this weaponry. Um, yeah. He's got a he's got a, 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 a hot chick just in a bikini in his kitchen doing stuff, and yet <laughs> his daughter his daughter comes out of his room and the door opens. It's just this this pink room of, of fairies and and everything else, and, <laughs> and 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 I remember looking at Seth and he just looked at me and went. Well, and uh, and, and it was big. interesting. Was weird. Like, if he had his hair grown in normal clothes on, you wouldn't know anything. Then he has his head shaved. He's got the skull tattoo. Yeah. He moves his Rolex. He's got a Rolex tattoo. Um, but he is a truly – he's a gentleman. He's actually a, a, an extraordinary lovely man. Hmm. Um, but when they're performing, it's, it's go time, right? Yeah. And so they, these guys do all this sort of stuff. And, um, yeah, there's, there were some crazy, crazy stories with them on the road. And, and, and then eventually – um, because of the rally connection, I ended up uh, meeting Travis Pastrana, Epic. and 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 I was there when he did his first double backflip um, in uh, in LA at the X Games. And again, um, one of the probably my top three athletes of all time. Um, he uh, he's just a pure professional um, mm-hmm. at, at what he does. And and I remember the best way to sum up motocross. Mm-hmm. I did an interview with him when he was doing Rally Greece. And uh, he said, my, pa- my aim in life is to go as hard and as fast as I can without dying. So, so far, I'm 100% pass. Yeah, fantastic. And, 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 <laughs> that, pretty that, much, like, yeah. and, that, and that pretty much summed it up. So, yeah, a, a lot of stuff in motocross. I mean, that's why I don't really like driving cars. I, I live on two wheels because I've, yep. um, I've had some very good mentors, I guess, and world mm-hmm. champions on bikes. So I, I love anything on two wheels epic and I'd, I'd imagine like dealing with people like that not only are they athletes um and they're performing you know at, at a top world level but the mentality that goes behind that and the the stuff that goes on behind the scenes you know the, the bloody crashes the fear all of that stuff would would be gold for a filmmaker to kind of yeah it, it's interesting i when i when i started off my career it's funny i i made a promise to myself that i wouldn't sensationalize it so I wouldn't cover the crashes. I wouldn't cover the the misery. I wouldn't cover the death. Even when we were doing the series, uh, rescue series on Everest, we didn't show dead bodies. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm a firm believer in you can show the drama without showing the drama. Mm-hmm. And even when we did the Krusty series, um, uh, I fought tooth and nail with the producers to say, when there's a crash, we don't zoom in on it. 
mm-hmm. and and we never did. And there were some chronic crashes um, yeah. because the guys that are crashing are professional mm. and they don't like to be seen crashing. Mm. Uh, and, the, and the work that these guys go into from, uh, I did a lot of work with Nikki Hayden in MotoGP, the amount of work that these guys do to go as fast and as hard as they can is monumental, mm. is monumental. I mean, the number of times Deegan tried to do backflips over a foam pit in his backyard and landing a bike in a foam pit isn't a comfortable thing, especially mm. when it lands on top of you. Um, they, they do it hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. So a lot of people, when they turn up to the shows and they see them do this, they don't realize what's gone in to doing that. So yeah. for me, I'd rather show the hard work and the ethic and yep. I've never really shown the crashes. And my work would probably be much more renowned if I'd shown the crashes. Yeah. But that's just, well, that, that's the, the yeah. ethic I had. Uh, yeah, it's a, that's a credit to you um, to, sh- to show that kind of stuff in a, in a tasteful way. You know what I mean? It, it's, a, it's a fine line between, you know, I guess showing it, uh, I guess, A for how it is. And, and, you know, you could get more views or whatever if you show that kind of stuff. But to keep things tasteful and respectful, it's a, it's a credit to you. And, and that's obviously, you know, pays uh, a tribute to what, where you are right now. Because yeah, it's, it's, it's a hard one. It's a hard one. I mean... You, a lot of people, especially in the days of social media now, they throw their ethics out. They just got to sensationalize it. They got to hype it up. And that's okay too. Everyone has to have their style. Um, but I've always kept, I guess, really true to that in that I won't, I won't do these things. And yep. if, it, if it meant that I went broke or the, 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 the network wouldn't take the show, then don't take it. Yep. I don't care. And you got to, you got to have that belief. And, and eventually people start approaching you because they want that that ethic um yeah, absolutely and uh, but it's very very easy for people to bend away from that especially mm. in today's world yep 100 percent. now um moving on from that i've got a question uh because i've you know been in the film world a little bit i've created a few things with other guys i'm curious to know like when you're heading to these kind of obscure places like like nepal you know where you're kind of uh, out in the elements and and you don't have the luxury of powerpoints and all that kind of stuff, um, you know, and you want to be kind of light, what kind of gear are you taking with you? Like how many cameras are you taking up the mountain? Like where are you at with that? I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure you have different setups, but say given the, the for the Nepal uh, project, yeah. what, what are you out on the road yeah. with, on the mountain? Well, we, we travel pretty light and I've always been a firm believer that the gear doesn't t- dictate the story. The, mm-hmm. uh, the story can dictate the gear. Mm-hmm. And, uh, that's where I really came across Zoom in the first place. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I was using a lot of other brands and they were just breaking. And mm-hmm. Zoom Lite, it worked. And I bought my first, um, I think it was the H6. And and it was just, it just worked. And it, I couldn't break this thing. And so you didn't need, uh, I'd always take two of everything in case. Um, wow. But, I, but uh, that's it. I had two units and um, I very rarely even, or I never opened the second one. It's still it was still brand new. Um, yep. I've, I've I've been backed by Canon for many years, but I've used their DSLRs. And people say, well, you can't do do feature films or feature documentaries on DSLRs. Well, uh, you know, I've got forty of them on Amazon Prime right now. Uh, they work. They work in the field. Um, they, they're bomb proof. Um, and so I, I literally my whole pack has two cameras, three lenses, two zoom f ones, and a backup drone in the top. My entire, I could make a feature film from 17 kilos of gear and that's it. Um, that's so cool. And that's a, that's also, I believe, like a skill in itself. You know, it's uh, proving that it's the man behind the camera, not necessarily the cameras themselves. Uh, if you can kind of, it's massively beneficial. Um, if you can kind well, see, of. Well, I mean, when, when, yeah, when you, when you think about it, um, yeah. where, where I'm heading, and a lot of people when they're making documentary style and not scripted stuff, you don't know what's going to happen. Mm. You don't know where it's going to happen. And if you're if you're too busy fiddling around with gear and trying to set up stabilizers and do all this stuff, you're going to miss the moment. Mm. And so I literally will carry two cameras. I'll have a, a 100 to 400 mil lens. I'll have a wide and that's it. And yep. I won't use any other lenses. I won't use any other light. I'll use natural light. The sensors mm-hmm. these days, I only shoot in HD. Mm-hmm. Um, the cameras have 4K sensors, so they let more light in. Um, I'm not a technical guy. I never yep. go into the fiddly side of things. Yep. I'm always on aperture priority. But, you know, the guys that build these cameras are way smarter than me. 
Yeah. So I trust them and I, and I let them go with it. You know, yeah. the audio, I literally plug it in, make sure the level's kind of all right, put it in my ears and hit record and mm-hmm. focus on chatting. And the technology allows you to look like you're really smart right. when I'm really not. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's the bottom line. And people look at the films and, and also the turnaround. Like, you know, we've got to have, I've got to have my shows. If it's an hour docker, I've got to have it done a week after the thing finishes. You know, otherwise it's out of people's mind. If I filmed a gig, if you take three weeks, four weeks, five weeks to put it out there, the vibe's gone. People yeah. have moved on to the next thing. So uh, for me, it's it's the workflow, yep. right? So when I when I look at what what the Zoom products are recording, I can throw it straight into my edit. Yeah, perfect. When I'm when I'm shooting on the Canon, it's a small conversion put into my edit. I haven't yep. used the other brands because the workflow takes too long. It's yep. as simple as that. But these days, if someone said what camera do I buy? You can buy anything as long as you can use it. Mm. But the, from the audio perspective, you know, uh, it's what's bomb proof and reliable. And, yeah. you know, I'm not, I'm not talking zoom up. Mm. It's just that the gear has 100% of the time delivered what I need. And if I've got it wrong, it's, I've got it wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. It's not, gotcha. it's not the gear, you know, yeah. it, it's, it's me that's messing up. Yeah, gotcha. You know, and that, that's because I bumped the, you know, I peaked it too high or something. That's why the F2 that's coming out is quite cool because apparently it's idiot proof. So I'm really keen nice. to see if, <laughs> if I can destroy it. So we're sweet. Uh, <laughs> yeah, perfect. Now I want to ask you uh, kind of a fun question here. You did some work with Chris Angel. <laughs> Tell us what it's like working with someone like that in, in that industry. I mean, that's an industry, it's like a, a gigantic secret as to kind of what happens behind the scenes there and how things work. I won't ask you to give away any secrets, but what was that experience like? Well, you did some digging, brother. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Chris Angel. You know, the the, the first time I'm, uh, we, we, we had the deal to film one of his second series of Mind Freak and um, we were based, um, I was based in LA, my crew was, based in in vegas mm-hmm. back off the strip in between a bar and a strip club so super cool studio mm-hmm. um the first time i met chris i was at the hollywood mega store um in uh, in la mm-hmm. and he was doing a signing but before the signing he was doing something for uh, one of the kids cancer charities and right. so i was sitting out the back with um this girl that had the bandana on and just sitting there waiting and chris came in with his manager i said g'day i mic'd him up and he did a couple of tricks in front of the camera where he made a, like, he got her to go and get a fork and he made the fork fall in half. I mean, the, the stuff he did in front of the camera, I was right there. I have no idea how he did it. But the really cool thing is he then went to the toilet. Yeah. And it's one of those cliche stories where he had the mic on and I could hear everything. Oh, yeah. And and he's, he's, he's taken a leak in the toilet with his manager and he was just talking about, he didn't give a shit about the signing. He just thought it was the coolest thing in the world to try and inspire this young girl with cancer. That's awesome. And and from that very moment, it was like, I'll bust my ass for this guy. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and he he was a showman. He could turn it on. Uh, mm-hmm. But behind the scenes, it's like anything. He just practiced and practiced and practiced. And yeah. to be honest, when we went through all the reels of all the, the stuff he did, apart from obviously humans can't fly and elephants don't disappear. We all know that. Mm. But most of the other tricks that he did – I could look over every camera angle and I still couldn't figure out how he did it. That. And, and, and I, would, I would just be going over and over. And there was one scene in New York where he put a, a pane of glass on Fifth Avenue and, and newspapers either side and he walked through the glass. And it doesn't matter what angle we looked at, I have no idea how he did the trick. So he, he, he wasn't just a magician on camera. Yeah. I mean, obviously, yeah, he in can't walk life. on water. Well, yeah, he can't walk on water because there's stuff under the water, all that normal hmm. stuff. But hmm. the general everyday stunts i couldn't we, that's why we love love doing it and so at the end of the season we got made an offer um for a christmas party mm-hmm. uh, because he was dating kendra from uh, the playboy mansion at that time oh. and they offered they offered the whole crew would you go to the playboy mansion for christmas party or the magic castle yeah and no one went to the playboy mansion Really? Every, everyone went to the Magic Castle and everyone came away with some crazy magic tricks. So it goes to show the impact that, that his performance had. And, you know, and Chris said to me, um, it's something that resonated over the last sort of 15 years since we filmed with him, is television doesn't make you famous. Hmm. The, it's the medium that you can use to make yourself famous. Right. And so he, he, was a, he was a very smart man of using that format 
through merchandise and other things to make himself famous. And, and through the years, I've always told pretty much every client that I've filmed with, mm. the film will make your audience or your clients or your market do something. It won't do it for you. Right. And, and so that was one of the biggest lessons that Chris taught me is that what we do will inspire someone to do something, whether it's to laugh, cry, smile, buy something, hate someone, click like or whatever it's like the music it'll it'll create you know and, and and if you go into the visual side of music when you look at the at, at the all the the um you know the manson murders and, and how the helter skelter thing came about mm-hmm. it will create someone an emotion to make someone do something all you can do is set it up mm. and so if you're writing lyrics to a song or you're you're creating a riff or a beat it will it will inspire someone to do something, hopefully to buy the album so they can then inspire other people. So if they buy the album, they can get the same emotion. Mm -hmm. So what Chris taught me back then has held me, has probably helped me more in my career than any other advice, to be honest, um, in terms of how he used the medium of his show. He said he, he, he he made a lot of money from the show, but he made more money from making the show work for him. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's That's huge uh, as well. Yeah, but he's a super, super gentleman. Again, um, very polite, very, very talented entertainer. Yeah. Very. Now, it has to be one of the most entertaining art forms, being a magician. It's it's so cool for oh. everyone. It's, it's awesome. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I reckon he picked up more chicks than, than you would as a drummer. I mean. Oh, yeah. hey. If he's going out with Kendra from the Playboy Mansion, he's. Actually, <laughs> the, 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 fun, the funniest story that I had with him, we were, I was sitting, because I was like well out of my depth with the production. I just, I had faked it until I made it in that industry. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were in the Rainbow Room on, on Sunset Boulevard. Yeah. And Chris is sitting there and all of a sudden David Copperfield walks in. <laughs> Sick. And, and I'm sitting there and I, I'm just this, this, this junior production dude that's running all post for this guy. And they had this huge argument because Chris was sitting in Copperfield's chair. Right. And so they had this huge argument about who was a more famous magician. Yeah. Well, I've got more TV hours. I've done this. And I'm just sitting there just going, dude, just, I'll just have another beer. This were, is were amazing. They, were they, were they mates or, or were they? No, no, they hated They were just having oh, this full no. on argument. And, and, and eventually, eventually the managers came in and settled it down and Chris let, Chris let uh, David have his seat, and it's like yeah. I'll never forget that. But yeah, it's just one of those crazy entertainment moments. I mean, there's loads of those I've seen over the years, mate. That's unreal. Just a just a young lad from Bondi, just putting together a few films. The next thing you're in the rainbow with the oh. two biggest magicians in the world arguing over it's, who's. It, lost it, it, yeah, and it, it, it doesn't seem real, and it's only as good as what you can do with that experience yep. as well, because you you can have a memory, but <laughs> it's what you, what are you going to do with that experience to make yeah. your career further itself you know that that's that's the question yeah and who knows yeah now now another thing i was thinking about a lot of your uh work seems to be abroad or interstate or you know you it seems like you've got to travel a lot for what you do you always seem to be somewhere far away so i mean obviously covid's hit and it's um been difficult you know a for music we've kind of stopped playing shows um, in terms of what you're doing, uh, we br- briefly spoke before about a new exciting project you've been involved with, which absolutely blew my mind. So I was going to ask you what you've been doing during COVID, and we kind of covered that before. So let's open up on this exciting new project you've been doing. Um, I will let you introduce it because it is so far over my head. I don't, I don't even know how to ask you about it. So, so yeah. tell us what you've been doing. It's, it's, it's kind of crazy because when, um, I mean, social media was working against me because I was traveling so much. And when I was posting a lot more that I was at home, I started to get a lot more local work and I'd probably never been busier than I had been. And, uh, and through just sheer randomness, I ended up picking up a gig, um, not as a filmer, but as a, as a photo journalist to cover a returning Japanese uh, space capsule to, to, to earth um and so i had to do some furious research and uh jack to the japanese space agency had sent the hayabusa 2 spacecraft to uh, 4.2 billion light years away to land on an asteroid to hopefully bring back samples of soil that would be representative of when earth was created so the quantum physics behind that just leaves me the dead and uh, they needed someone to to cover it for the world's media and uh, the premise was they needed to have someone that had experience shooting from helicopters. And I hadn't shot on helicopters for years because of drones, but I'd had thousands of hours. So they literally said, okay, 
um, here's the gig. I was the only um, Aussie guy on the gig. It was all Japanese crew. Um, so I, I, I ended up uh, having to get permission to get to South Australia, have all the COVID tests, do all the quarantine mm-hmm. things. Went to South Australia, drove out to Woomera, and you know, on the 6th of December, I was on the recovery helicopter with the lead scientist and, and shot some images that I think over 500 million people have seen so far. Uh, so, you know, you, you, you get to sort of hang out with a, a space capsule that's been on a, an asteroid. And, and for me, that probably will never happen again. It was one of the most unique experiences. But again, when those jobs, you, you're so focused at what you've got to do because, you know, I, I hadn't really thought about it much. And yeah. you get quite sleep deprived on these. And, mm. and my, my wife's Japanese and, and my parents in law live in Japan. And my father-in-law doesn't really message much. He's in his 70s. Yep. And about five in the morning when it landed, he sends me a text and he said, uh, um, good luck. All of Japan's watching. Don't mess up. Wow. And, and, and I remember looking at that text and I shat myself. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's like after all of these years, all I've got to do is make sure that I get, a, I get literally the first shot of this thing. And you put it in perspective, you're in the oldest helicopter that you could get. It's it's rattling like nothing else. You're holding a 400 mil lens hanging out of the door at 140 foot. And you're asking the helicopter pilot to try and make sure you can get it in frame. And you just literally you hold your finger down. Um, and when I realized I actually got at least one shot, I was finally relieved. And nice. then it went from there. So it... Uh, but again, with those things, there's no ego. I don't have credit on the photos. They're all credited mm. as JAXA. Um, okay. I, never, I never put my name on them. I think because of the project, um, I, it needed to have a humble nature about it. Yep. Now, now I've got some, some questions spring to mind. So initially when you started telling me that, I was thinking that you were putting cameras in the, the spacecraft while it was launching up. I was thinking, how on earth are you taking photos <laughs> like of a bloody spaceship in, in outer space? So you were basically capturing it as it came back to Earth. Is that correct? Yeah. So the... Um... It it, it, it it launched out. So the space capsule itself bounced off our atmosphere and dropped the capsule itself in. And then the spaceship took off again on another seven year mission. So right. um, it, uh, it, it landed, we couldn't capture it uh, coming through the atmosphere. There was a crew that shot the high altitude stuff. Okay. Yep. But when it, when it actually landed, we had to have to find it in the desert. So we had to, um, so we had to get the first shots of it when, we're the first human eyes to see it back in Earth because it came right. through at night time. So as soon as it came up light, we yep. had to go out there and find it. And there's lots of technology they use to locate it, um, right. the rocket range. And uh, yeah, so we were the first people to actively see it and go with this, the team that picked it up and right. to get the sample out. So, so you kind of got the photos. It was it was touchdown, and, and you were the, the, those photos were the first photos of that back on planet Earth. Yep. Uh, yep, yep. Yep. Uh, yep. Yeah. 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 I, I was thinking mate you had to you had a time limit from atmosphere to earth and you were floating around in a chopper and you had to get clear shots of it like i would have loved that, that. Was... i would have loved that i was hoping that would be the case <laughs> yeah. um oh because that that would just be insane um but the, the way it worked out it, it uh because of the um the atmosphere and all the, the the physics around it it needed to come in in the stillest air and that was at six in the morning so nice. it was still dark yeah, and it, I guess it is like it's one of those things when you mentioned that as soon as you got one shot, you felt better. I feel like that yeah. playing gigs. As soon as I mm. get one song under the belt, like you go out, the intro works, you sit down, play a song, everything's working in your ears, everything's sweet, yeah. you're good. It gives you a little bit of confidence. So hundred percent, hundred percent. You got to and, and up until then, look, you know your skill, you know what you've got to do, but there's so many variables that are out of, out of your control. That you've got to hope come together, and then once they do then you almost feel like, okay, I've got that lucky shot and now I'll get into my rhythm and, and get the, the proper stuff. Yeah, uh, uh, 100%, 100%. Well, that's, that's, that's so cool, man. Uh, all of Japan was watching and I'm sure, you know, all of the other countries. That's mega, mate. Um, just another kind of notch on your board of <laughs> things that you've done. It's, it spans so far and great and wide. And, um, you know, just some of those stories that you've shared with us today are, are, are mega, mate, and there's some awesome learning. So I actually... For myself and the listeners, the Leighton Hewitt. So, what was that? So the Leighton Hewitt doco, because I want to go and watch that now that I know that that cool. was you. Yeah. Yeah, it was. A, it was. A, it was called um, the other side. I don't even know if it's around anymore. It yeah. was on DVD. It was so long ago. I mean, right. it might be. 
we'll be able to be somewhere. Out. Yeah, that, yeah, it, that, it that'd could be, be somewhere. Yeah. And then, and then the Chris Angel thing was that season two of, of what, what was Mast Mind Freaks? Is that what it was called? Yeah, Mind Freaks. Yeah, it was season yeah. two. Yeah, so yeah. we did all the we did all the post production out of LA on that. Um, yeah. And I've, I've, out of all the, out of all the, the genres, I actually enjoy the editing more than the filming. Um, yep. And it's it's that's where the story's made, and that's where you can create that emotion. Whereas yep. um, I very rarely. Uh, now I shoot all my own stuff, but I've, I've never really shot for other people. I've done a couple of gigs um, where I've just shot and handed the memory cards over, but that yep. for me is like mowing lawns. It just doesn't have any any mm-hmm. uh, real 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 value, you know. Yeah. So it's like if you write your own music, you know, yep. it just have, has has that that balance. Got yeah. Now, hey, one last quick question. Um, obviously, you've travelled far and wide. You you lived in the US, obviously, uh, for a while. So how long did you live in the states for? And and I guess. What was the transition like for you going from being an Aussie guy who would kind of pop out, you know, all over the place to kind of then basing yourself over in the States? So, like, what one, what was the transition like? And two, what was the, uh, I guess, the gig or the event or, you know, the, the moment that allowed you to go from A to B and, and, and place yourself yeah. in permit? Yeah, I mean, all, all, all the romantics... Uh, thoughts of going to live and work in the states are all garbage. Um, I'm sure it do- I'm sure it does happen for a lot of people, but I uh, I got offered an opportunity to actually work um, on um, on the Jerry Springer show. Funnily enough, oh. and uh, and so I had to base myself out of Chicago, and then through yeah. the producers there, I moved to LA, and we were pitching for some Discovery biker builder shows with Roland Sands. We tried to get you know, end up getting the Chris Angel show. We're just pitching ourselves around, just me and, and my cousin at that stage. And we had a, a tiny little studio with no windows in Western La Cienega in LA. And we were living in a, in a holiday inn, eating takeaway food every day and literally for three months flogging our asses uh, yep. to try and get get something happening. And, and luckily enough, the people that we were pitching to were across the hallway. And they oh, said, wow. hey, you guys want to just, sometimes if you just put the yards in, you can be yep. in the right place at the right time. Yeah, and um, and you just keep saying yes to shows and, and working your way through. So I end up spending a couple of years there, um, mm. and the biggest part, but the hardest part, isn't the work ethic because if you work hard enough, you'll find a way. You mm. always find a way. Yep. The hardest part is in when you speak Australian, no one in America understands you. <laughs> nobody, but like nobody understands what you're saying, and even though you're speaking English, no one gets what you're saying. So that <laughs> to, to, that was my biggest challenge. Just you know, when you move into a place and you try and get cable put on or try and get electricity put yeah, on, yeah, yeah, you know, um, do you find yourself putting on a bit of an American twang? When when I go over there, I'll order coffees, and when they when they um ask my name, I say Dan. They're yeah, like, you have to, name? and I say Dan because I go, yeah, Dan. And they're like, Don. Yeah, hundred percent. Like, not nah, Dan. Like, Daryl. So I, I do a bit of a twang when I'm over there on when I'm ordering food and stuff just to make it oh. easier because I can't be bothered explaining it again. No, you have to. If you don't do that, they understand you. And the other alternative is just learn to speak Spanish. I mean, that's it. You know, so you know, Spanish is the first language in uh, in America. And uh, yeah. yeah, you have to. If you don't, if you don't, and people and when mates came across to visit me, even when my wife came across, she'd say, "Let me stop being so fake and trying to put on an American accent." It's like <laughs> I'm actually not. You try it. Like you go and try it. They just won't. They, they don't understand you, and that's fair enough, yeah. right? But yeah, yeah, I, yeah. yeah, people just think you, you you've been a tosser because you you're trying to speak like an American. It's like, no, I, just, <laughs> I just want a coffee, man. Or yeah. I want a beer. What do you mean a beer? It's like a beer. Oh, yeah. you want a beer? Yeah, that's what I said. But yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's funny. Right, totally. hey, that's that's so interesting, man. I could talk to you for hours. I mean, still, we're just unraveling things. Like you worked on Jerry Springer. God, for God's <laughs> sake, it, that doesn't end. Yeah, it's, it's kind of funny because when I when I look back through my whole career, um, mm. again you're only as good as your last story, right? Yeah. And no one says I'm going to pay you for what you did 15 years ago, mm. but you, you've always constantly got to be doing something new and fresh. Yeah. Uh, and and use your experience for that, so you you never really have a down day in your head. You've got to keep pushing, and if you do, um, it's freaking amazing because like I look back over the last 25 years and and just it's just ridiculous. Yeah, I, it's just ridiculous. Imagine, yeah, I'd imagine it would trip you out. I mean, I'm the same, and I think most creatives are the same in the sense that you're always looking for that next thing, and, and it doesn't really matter what you've done because that's that's been and gone. And you're always looking for what's coming up. Like I, I get excited about kids coming up or events or whatever it might be. I'm sure you're the same with what you do. Um, but yeah, I, I'm sure you would sit there sometimes and, and just be like, 
tripping it's on kinda, it. It's kind of – it's crazy because I look at – like over this side, I've got a photo of the space capsule, and behind me, it's interesting, uh, Mike Metzger, who was one of the original Krusties, yeah. um, he started the Zoo York brand. Oh, no. And uh, – <laughs> And that's that's from him from 2009, and he signed that, and I got it framed. And I'm just sitting, just that's just sitting on my floor in the studio. So it's kind of funny from the crusty days to a satellite. It's um, well, I've to, never yeah, you made I, me think about it. It's kind of crazy. Yeah, I mean, like just yeah, from where I'm sitting, looking at everything you've done, it's like this, like the worlds are so far apart. Space. I should have. Them. I should have more money in the bank. Fuck. <laughs> what have I done with it all, man? <laughs> what have I done with it all? I don't know. Healthy, very rich with experiences. You know. Yeah. Yeah. But mate, that that was uh, that was an absolute pleasure to, to chat to you. And I'm, I must admit, the the interview that we did earlier with this series was probably the best interview I've ever done. I left that interview going, "Geez, Anthony is an epic." epic epic host so i was actually shooting myself a little bit about doing this because the standard, the standard <laughs> well, mate, you've you've uh you've, you've returned the favor that was um I've got, I've got an edit to do now i'm going to sit down for an hour and have a coffee just to digest it because you made me think of stuff that you know you're almost it's almost like dating someone for the first time they've gone through your whole history and just went holy shit i can't hide anything now so mate that was <laughs> thank you that that really got me thinking um mate, that, that's that awesome. was uh, I just can't wait till we can actually catch up together and hang out in Melbourne or in Sydney when we're allowed to cross the border. That would be insane. I mean, honestly, if I had a wish list right now of what I could do in, in my career, mm. I would just love to see one of your gigs. Oh. I, just, I, would love, I would love to be a punter that just sits in the back row and just goes, I just want to soak this in. That, that would be in my top five right now, just to see the gig. And, and uh, it's like when I, when I, years later when I'd finished working with Leighton and I was just a local tennis tournament in sydney yep. and he came he was a host the host and he, he saw happened to see me and i was waiting long he goes, he goes gordo why didn't you just get tickets it's like no mate i don't i don't want this backstage shit anymore <laughs> i want to i want to sit with the crappy food with my daughter and my wife in the back row yeah and enjoy the tennis and yeah. i'd just love to and i wouldn't even tell you i was coming i'll just roll up and i'll just sit in the back row and you just because you know what everyone that watches what we do and i'd leave it on this everyone that watches what we do all wants to be behind the scenes, get the autographs and see what they do. Mm -hmm. Having spent 25 years behind the scenes of some of the greatest events on earth, mm -hmm. the best place is second back row, shitty mm -hmm. food, mm -hmm. soaking in the experience. Yeah. That's, so, that's, yeah. We, yeah. That, that is without word of a lie. You're just sitting there going, let it all in. And that's the, the best place is let us bring this stuff to you, but sit in the back row. It's the best place to be. Yep. No, I agree. Great, great way to wrap it up, mate. That was that was epic. Now, one last thing. Um, where can people find these photos of this Japanese space mission? Yeah, good question. So I'm going to um, I'll uh, I'll send some I'll send some through to the guys at Dynamic yep. Music and yep. uh, and they can um, they can put it out there. They're not that staggering. I mean, if you're into spacecrafts, I guess uh, you'd be pretty. I mean, it's pretty, pretty on it. cool. Maybe what we'll, maybe what we'll do we'll get we'll get Justin to share share a link to your site uh, obviously in the notes so people can jump on and just check out all the crazy stuff you've done because again it's like it's too much to talk about it's we've only touched <laughs> on obviously like three or four things out of thousands and they're all as impressive and and interesting as each other so yeah, yeah. mate it's been an absolute pleasure to chat to you um mate i'm looking cool. forward to catching up i'll look forward to seeing you in the back row at one of our gigs soon just well, thank you. Yeah, thank you for, for, for your thank you for your time, not just for the interview, but the research you've done, and also for sort of bringing a different perspective into my edits through through your music and your world. So it's uh, it's it's massively appreciated, mate. Massively, mate. It's been good fun. So I'll leave I'll leave you to it, man. Thanks again, and uh, thanks everyone for listening to this episode. And um, we'll see you in the next one. Well, you'll see them in the next one. <laughs>